This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. I am here with Steve Fredlund, the Black Rhino Man. Welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thank you, David. I've never been introduced as the Black Rhino Man, so that's exciting for me. Well, there you go. So Black Rhino Living, right? And we'll talk about where that came from and what that is here in a moment. But even before that, Steve, talk a little bit about the career path that brought you to where you are now, and then what in the world made you pursue this crazy business of speaking and coaching? Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, I never in a million years thought that this would be my path at this stage of my life. So I am a a mathematician. Uh, I grew up as a mathematician. I went to school to be a mathematician, supplemented that with MBA and some business training. And so most of my life, I've been in the world of finance. So worked for a number of Fortune 500 companies, I'm an actuary by trade, so I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. I've started and led some capital markets hedging programs, which is basically doing calculus every day (laughs) in the investment world. So just very, very highly analytical stuff. But I always struggled with, man, I just want more. I just want something different. You know, more is maybe the wrong word, but I just felt like it was always kind of a square peg and a round hole a little bit. Like, yeah, I'm really good at math, but it's just not fulfilling me. So I've, for 25 years, I sort of had that, burning in me. And so I would take new jobs inside the same company, or I would take new jobs with new companies, just kind of, I think, always in search of that thing that would fulfill me, even though my jobs were great, right? On paper, life was perfect. So that's my journey of 28 years of being in the corporate world, just kind of grinding and grinding and grinding. And then finally, it came to a head where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Uh, This just is not who I am. And so I launched out on my own uh, at the end of 2018. So not very long ago with fear and trepidation, but my youngest child had just gone off to college. So, you know, the dynamics were changing a little bit and I planned on going into the world of consulting. So I love nonprofit work. I've started a nonprofit myself and I just love that. I thought, well, I'm going to do consulting for, you know, Fortune 500 companies if they'll have me, but man, I'd love to do it for these nonprofits that can't typically afford the skill set and the experience that comes with being an MBA and an actuary and all of those things. So that was the path I thought I'd be on. And then I got asked by somebody, hey, do you do executive coaching? Like, well, yes, I do. What is executive coaching? Uh, And and so I I did that and I loved it. I loved the one-on-one. I loved the relational side of things. And it just sort of then evolved more into uh, personal coaching. But all the while, I've always loved, I've been an entertainer. I've been in productions I've always done a lot of speaking for my job at conferences and that sort of thing. So that was always kind of lingering there. And then I had a couple opportunities to speak and actually just do speaking, like get paid to speak. I was like, wow, I love this. And it's funny because I'm an introvert at heart, but there's something about being able to, I'm a five on the Enneagram. If you know anything about personalities, I love to just consume information, figure out how to say it in a way that's clear and you know, applicable to everybody and then share it. And that's what I found in speaking. So I'm still on the journey, man, but that's a high level overview of of how I got here somehow. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the corporate speaking because, or speaking as a corporate executive, because you also have a fantastic corporate background just from your bio, working for big corporations like Allianz and Medtronic and Thrivent and 3M. In the course of all of your executive roles. How do you get the speaking bug? How did that bite you? You know, was that a natural for you or did you have to study or give us the whole evolution of Steve as the corporate speaker first? (laughs) Because I started my career and, you know, most of my career was in the analytical side. This might sound bad, but there really wasn't a high bar for the capability to speak. A lot of analytics really struggle in that role. And so even as a, as a very young person, as an intern, they'd say, hey, this looks like a really good result. Can you share this with whatever team that might be? And that doesn't even have to be a high-level team. And I would share it, and people said, man, that was really good. That was really clear. It was really understandable. And I don't think I was that good at that point in time. But I think the bar was pretty low because really, honestly, just actuaries are known as accountants, but without the personality. Like most of us really, really struggle with that. And so presenting is either very fearful or we tend to really go into the the details of it. 
And I'm just a believer of the details are what support the actual message and really focusing on the message itself and not feeling this obligation to have to share everything that I did. And I think that's what a lot of analytics struggle with. So that was really the evolution was just sort of sharing it in those groups. And then because of that, you get opportunities. People say, oh, Steve, why don't you actually share the results here? Even though you know you might be junior on this team, And I would do that in a way that wouldn't take credit for everything. I think that's another hindrance inside of the corporate world for speakers is that if they have the platform, they feel like they should be taking the credit. And so I think the combination of being able to think through what is the key message, stay on point, focus on that, support it with the details, but then do it in a way that gives credit to those who did the work and the team that did the work. I think those kept creating more and more opportunities. So I think the situation was right for me. And then being able to present it in the way I did just kept creating more and more opportunities. And then, of course, working for the large companies, the conferences approached them and say, hey, could you send somebody to speak about how do you start a hedging program? Well, we trust that Steve can actually do that and represent the company well. Let's send Steve to go do that. And so that just started creating more and more opportunities for that. And tell me a little bit about as you were doing that. You know, it's a tricky balance, right? Because you're building your personal brand and you're building the company brand and you're also the face and the voice of the company on this particular topic for that audience. Did you ever get any pushback about, hey, Steve, buddy, slow down here. Come back to the office. How about we do more actuarial work versus you going out and doing all of this quote unquote glamorous speaking, which we know is not really (laughs) glamorous at all. But was there any kind of push and pull between the personal brand as far as the speaking goes, and what the company wanted to happen? There wasn't so many opportunities that it became a hindrance to the job. You know, I think a lot of our companies that I worked for were like resistant to saying, well, we really don't want to send somebody because this is proprietary information and we're worried that somebody's going to, you know, our competitors are going to hear about this. So there were enough opportunities where it gave me the bug, where it put the name out there, that it didn't become a hindrance on the company itself. But there were a couple of times where people were like, okay, we need to decline that offer to do that because we just have so much going on here and we can't have you going on the road. I think, you know, you mentioned about personal brand. That's very interesting because I've never even thought about personal brand until I left the corporate world. Like I look back now, I'm like, I had so many opportunities to expand my personal brand. I'm just not wired that way. I don't think that way. And I wish I would have. Like I had phenomenal interviews where I was in magazines and all these different things. And it was always promoting the company or the work or encouraging people, you know, on how they could actually succeed in business themselves better. I'm not trying to like sound humble or whatever. I wish that I would have actually thought more about how can I leverage this to actually raise my own exposure for other opportunities. I just never really thought like that. Right, right. Well, let me also ask you then the transition, because some people do okay with this transition and some people are like really shocked, like being thrown into a tub of cold water. When you leave the six-figure job with the bonuses and the stock options and all the corporate perks and all of this stuff, and now it's like Steve representing Steve, just like I'm David representing David. You no longer have the fancy logo on your business card like I used to have and like you used to have. How was that transition? Because I'm guessing when you were in your executive roles, you sent an email, you got a response. You made a phone call, they called you back. And now it's like, who is this guy? And it might be kind of a, you know, cold, harsh light of day realization to people that it changes once you're out as an entrepreneur. How did you manage that transition or what surprised you about it? And what part of it were you expecting? Yeah, a hundred percent. You hit the nail on the head. That was, it's almost like you were reading my mail. Like if that was the one thing that I wasn't really ready for was that, like, I just think, well, all the success here is just going to roll naturally into success, you know, over here. (laughs) And it didn't like, okay, I can say I'm Steve Fredland and I worked here, 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 here. Here's my credentials. But so what versus I'm writing on behalf of this big, massive, you know, $50 billion company. And I would like your input on this or your response. Oh, okay. Of course we'll do that. So it's really hard. And I'm not naturally a self-promoter. I'm just not. And so it's very difficult for me, even when I have products that I believe in or, you know, a talk that I believe in, it's hard for me to say, no, man, this is going to knock your socks off. This is going to, you know, your audience is going to go crazy. They're going to love you as an event planner. That's just not my style. And I'm really still struggling with that. Like, how do I do that? If I have something that I'm really passionate about and I know will change lives 
if people could just hear the message for me to go out and tell people this will change your lives because I'm something, I, I really do struggle with that. But that was really a, a huge point for me of going, wow, okay, I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid of you know, doing all I need to do to make the contacts. It's just like, I just lost that instant credibility, not to mention everything else you talked about, all the bonuses, all the income and all those things. But that's a big issue for me personally is, is trying to overcome that hurdle and surround myself with people that can maybe help in that way. Hey, this interview is a real moneymaker. If you're serious about ramping up your reach and revenue as a speaker, trainer, or expert, book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team. The link is doitmarketing.com slash call. It will be the most valuable 45 minutes you invest in your speaking-driven business. Speaking of value, let's get back to the show. Now, you're a numbers guy, yeah. right? From an actuarial, financial, statistical background, when you made the leap, did you do the math about, okay, six-month cushion, 12-month cushion, <laughs> if I get my first couple of gigs, great, but even if I get nothing, I'm going to be okay for six months or a year? Or how did you navigate that for yourself and then you know, among family members who obviously love yep. you and care about you? They're like, Steve, are you insane? <laughs> You're going from X number of six figures, right, to zero. And how's that going to work? So tell us how you planned for it. And then yeah. tell us how you shared with people important to you about your plan. Yeah, well, first off, I think there's a lot of family and friends who still think I'm absolutely insane. And I probably am. And I've actually written about this, how you know life can be so good on paper. Like if I looked at my life on paper two years ago, year and a half ago, everything was perfect. Everything was absolutely perfect, but inside I was dying. So what do you do with that? But in terms of the actual planning, yeah, it's been sort of a, I won't say a negotiation, but with my wife and family about this for a few years about, you know, I, I really I feel like I need to leave the corporate world, but you know, we have all these responsibilities and blah, 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 blah. And finally, you know, we came to a place where I said, okay, well, here's the new proposal. Let's go like this. And if it doesn't look promising after six or eight months, and we kind of defined what that looked like, what promising was, then I'll go back to the corporate world, or at least I'll try. If they'll have me, I'll go back. And I felt pretty confident that I was marketable enough with my experiences and those things that I could get something. We don't have a big lavish lifestyle. So even if I had to take a pay cut, that wasn't the biggest issue. On the other side, we're also give away most of the stuff a lot of stuff that we make. So we weren't like huge savers, like, oh, we're saved up. So now I can just retire when I'm 50 and, and be fine. Uh, we just didn't really have that sort of lifestyle either. So we came up with a plan that said, okay, after six to eight months, if the revenue is not at this point, I'm going to go back and start looking for a corporate gig. And so I had one New Year's resolution in 2019, and that was to still be self-employed by the end of 2019. That was my only New Year's resolution that I had. And so it was this process of negotiating because you know, I want to honor her. I want to honor the family. I want to make sure that, you know, both of us come from a background that's not a wealthy background. Uh, we both kind of struggled growing up with, you know, in some poverty and those sorts of things. And so being financially stable is very important to both of us. And so I did not want to jeopardize that at the cost of pursuing my dream, I guess, if you will. So it was a numbers thing, but it was also a heart thing. It was also kind of a, a very strong communication thing, making sure we're on the same page. Because obviously, I don't want to get to the point where my family resents me for trying. I want them to be excited that I'm trying, yet I want to honor them and say, okay, yeah, but if this doesn't work, we'll go to plan B and kind of either go back to the corporate world or you know pick up a bunch of adjunct teaching or do something to help supplement. So there was some strategy involved in making the decision. It wasn't like some people do where they just wake up one day and say, well, here we go. It was a little bit more strategic than that. Would this be a good time for me to tell you that back in 2002, I was your here we go guy? I would love to hear that. I was like, oh, here we go. Whoa, woo, jump off the cliff. Is no that plan, right? no nest egg, no cushion, no nothing. Yeah. Just, let's see how it works. <laughs> and first three years, total train wreck. But mm. that's a separate story. I want to hear it though. But <laughs> into your criteria, yeah. so you said six to eight months. Was it income replacement from the last corporate job? Was it a certain, and you don't need to share specific sure. numbers if you don't yeah. want to. Was it sort of a percentage or how did you analyze what that, I'm guessing there was yeah. a must have number and there was a like to have number and then there was a dream number or how did you work it? There was a minimum number and it was a really low number because, you know, as I, as I talk to people, I mean, you know, speaking especially is sort of a longer term gig. 
but really I'd say it was more of a momentum piece. So there were some numbers involved, but it was really like, if we feel like there's momentum, like if this personal coaching stuff, if there's more and more people showing interest and a couple of them, you know, get landed for an hour or two a week or something like that. If I'm starting to do some of these things around consulting and it seems like I'm getting a bunch of meetings, if there seems like that's of interest to people and people are following up as an analytic it's really hard. You know, you want those hard, fast numbers, but I really looked at it and we really looked at it together is if it feels like it's going to work which I know is super soft, right? But that's really what it was because I couldn't promise a number. It was really just, do we feel like this is working? And part of it is externally, but also internally. How am I feeling? Like, I think I'll be great adjusting from, you know, working from eight to five, five days a week to just doing it all on my own and being self-motivated and all those things. But I didn't know. So there's an internal and an external component. And frankly, it's also, how does my wife feel about this? How is she feeling about me officing from home all of the time? How is she feeling about the financial situation and the momentum? And is my personality gotten better or worse? Like by the end of my corporate life, it was pretty rough. I was miserable, frankly. And so I'll just be honest, whatever. But I was pretty miserable. And so part of this is also this transition to living life like I talk about, living life with intentionality, living life in a way where you're excited and anticipating every day and you're, you can't wait to wake up and kind of bring on the day, let's go. And I completely lost that. And so what's the value of that? To be able to bring that into my family and to my friendships and to my other relationships where I'm kind of the guy that's bringing life into the group rather than this guy who's just it's kind of a downer. You know? And I was never really that guy, but I'm, I could just tell I wasn't as fun. I wasn't living life as richly as I was. So long answer to a short question, but there was some minor financial requirements for the first year, but it was really more of this other stuff like this. Let's talk about how you help your clients and think about it in terms of a pie where there's speaking, there's coaching, there's consulting, there's life coaching, executive coaching, et cetera. How did you initially envision the pie? And then how did the pie turn out? What did you end up doing (laughs) more of that surprised you or less of, or what kind of work was more elusive or tougher to get? When I came out, I thought the pie was going to be 90% consulting, 10% speaking. And of that consulting, I would say I really expected most of that to be analytical type of consulting or even like small business consulting. How do we use balance sheets and income statements to help us increase our bottom line and make strategic decisions and all of those things? That's what I thought it would be. It'd be interesting to actually do this sort of exercise. Like, where was I every month along the way and watch the pie change? Because coaching wasn't on the pie. I would say right now with what I do, I would say it's probably 30% speaking, 50% coaching, and 20% consulting. And that coaching is almost all personal coaching, which is something I never expected either. You know, I've always been, I think, a good listener. I've always been a good question asker. I've always been somebody kind of help get clarity from complex situations. But I've always applied that to corporate settings or, you know, investment decisions or those sorts of things. And now I'm applying it to people's lives. And I love it. I just love it. So that's where the pie is completely shifted. And it's probably going to keep shifting until, you know, there's really kind of that thing that really resonates with people and that really, you know, alivens me. Yeah. Let me ask you about coaching, because this is kind of an ongoing battle with my clients and my colleagues who are, quote unquote, capital C coaches, meaning they have the certification, they've done hundreds of hours, they have all the right letters after their name. I personally do a lot of coaching and mentoring, no certification, no coaching school, no nothing. My clients get amazing results, and that seems to be more important than letters after their name. (laughs) Were you stymied by this whole coaching infrastructure and all this, you know, sort of industry standardization around coaching, or did you not let that stop you at all? You know, the people that I've been approaching for coaching or that have gotten coaching aren't really in the coaching world. Like, I think the biggest hurdle that I have with people is, why would I need a personal coach? What is that? I don't even understand what that is. I think that's more of the world that I'm in is helping people understand why having a personal coach for your life is important or it could really help you. It's why, you know, Tiger Woods has a swing coach. You know, what? That's crazy. It's that same thing. In regard to that sort of thing, I've always shied away from the structured idea of coaching because as soon as people know you're a coach, a lot of people say, hey, you could come into my training program and all of those things. And I'm sure they're wonderful. I'm sure they're wonderful. Some of them are quite expensive, but I've always kind of 
shied away from that because I feel like that might take away from the value of what I bring just naturally is who I am and the questions that I ask. I was the same way in the corporate world. Like I do strategic workforce planning, which is really let's look at things and let's figure out how do we strategize so that we have the workforce that we need in five years when the world changes. But when you want to do that or when you're involved in that, people say, okay, well, here's the program you need to follow. And I look at the programs like, well, that's, but every situation is so uniquely different. If I start going in and start, I start leading this company with a program, I'm going to miss out on the heartbeat of that company and what they really need and what they're trying to do because we might not ask the right question in the program or whatever. So I feel the same way with coaching. Like it's a little unsettling to go into a coaching arrangement and just say, all right, tell me your story. What's going on in your world? Versus going in with a set of here's 30 questions that I'm going to ask you and you answer those and then we'll figure out what to do. So it's a little more unsettling. It's a little (laughs) less structured, but For me, I find that within 15 minutes, you figure out what people really are looking for, whether it's their career or whether it's their business or whether it's their personal life, that I think I wouldn't have gotten to if I did the structured approach. Maybe it's more of a personality fit and that sort of thing. I'm comfortable in the chaos. You know, I'm comfortable in in all that ambiguity of kind of sorting that out and trying to dig clarity, whereas other people might prefer to have a program. Super quick commercial break. Isn't this interview amazing? If you'd like to get more ideas on how to start or grow your speaking business fast, pop over to our free training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Now, between the consulting and the personal coaching and the speaking, what have you found over the last couple of years, 18 months, door opening strategies, How are we generating leads? How are you getting yourself in front of the folks that you really want to help and serve? I mean, if I'm going to be completely honest, it's a struggle. I think I'm being very inefficient with that. I think social media has opened up some platforms, but I think the best thing that's happened for me is word of mouth. And I don't know how to best leverage that. But I think as an unknown commodity in the speaking world, like I'm not somebody who's been speaking since I was 20 years old. So I don't have this huge portfolio of visible things. Now I've spoken 140 times, but it turns out a lot of those conference breakout sessions and keynotes aren't recorded. So I don't have this big portfolio that I can show people and say, hey, I can really speak, just trust me. So I don't have that. I think in the coaching world, I'm brand new to the coaching world. You know, what is that deal? Consulting, who's this guy? Steve Fredlin Consulting, what's that? I've heard of these consulting firms. Is this just some rogue guy? And so it's hard to get your foot in the door to say, no, here's all of my experiences and here's all of this when you don't have that initial pop you know, of the name brand. I'm not David Newman. I can't just say, hey, I'm David Newman. Oh, hey, cool. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I think that's the biggest struggle. But I think where the growth is really happening is the people that I have helped and then being more strategic, which I'm just starting to do more of saying, okay, can you just give me a, a minute and a half video of you saying how great this was? And that's where my self-promotion hurts because it feels so awkward to me to ask for that. Could you just talk about how awesome I am? I know you said I was awesome. And then trying to use that, you know, in the different media platforms to get the word out. So largely what's happened is, you know, I work with one person and then they go to their networking group and they tell people, oh my gosh, I never thought I would want a personal coach, but I just met with this Steve guy. He was fantastic. And then I get a few calls from people saying, hey, you know, these people just talked to me. They just said that you could help with this. I'm like, yeah, I'd love to chat with you about that. So it's word of mouth. Speaking is the same thing. And consulting, you know, is the same thing as well. I think for me, it's, I feel like I'm spread all over the place. And I don't know if that's the right strategy. It sort of feels like I'm just kind of a shotgunning approach. Like I'll go wherever, talk to whoever, do speaking, do coaching, do consulting and hopes that that sort of builds them more and more momentum. Or if it's better to say, you know what? I'm a speaker. That's what I do. And I'm going to focus there, which was sort of how I was leaning a few months ago. And then of course, the speaking gigs I've got have almost all been canceled. And so that sort of rattles the cage a little bit there as well. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next is that right now, as we're recording this, of course, we're in the middle of this kind of coronavirus craziness. It is crazy. And I have a friend whose name is Jim Mathis, and he started his speaking business around the financial meltdown of 2008. Mm. And the message that he took to the market back then was the economy's not down, it's different. Mm. And when the economy comes back, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be fine, but we're going to be living in a different world after 2008 than the world before 2008. And I think that same message is happening now in 2020, 
that yes, of course, things are going to get better, things are going to improve, but they're never going to be the same as they were before. What are you doing to virtualize, put more things online, online courses, doubling down on video? What are you doing to make sure that even if your live sessions come back, which I'm pretty sure they will, that you always have some sort of online or remote training or virtual options for your clients? You know, a lot of the coaching that I've done in the past has been virtual anyway. Zoom is a very good friend of mine. <laughs> and so We should have uh, all bought stock. Right? <laughs> in, in all of the video conferencing systems. So I've always used Zoom for a lot because a lot of my clients aren't local anyway. And plus, uh, it gives an opportunity to record those sessions if they want. And so it's, it's a wonderful tool. So what I've been doing is just doing more and more coaching. So I've gotten a few more people that the flip side of people being either out of work or working from home is they now have more capacity to do things like coaching. And a lot of the personal coaching are people that are just struggling with this thing too. So I've seen you know the coaching side increase. I've got more calls even just today from people saying, hey, I wonder what does this look like for me to just chat? And you know, you're part mentor, you're part coach, you're part therapist. All of those things sort of melded into one. People just want an outlet to share their thoughts and, and to be heard. So the shift from live speaking is shifting to video coaching but I'm also encouraging some of those folks that I had speaking gigs with to say, we could do this virtually. We could do this virtually. You know, I've got the technology. I can have hundreds of people join. If that's something you want to do, we can make it interactive. I've got polls everywhere. We can do polls. We can do all kinds of fun stuff. And I think people just still don't have a vision of what that is yet for a lot of the associations and such that I'm dealing with. They don't really get if that would work and how that would look. So I'm, I'm trying to encourage that piece. One of the things I've done recently too which was very well received. And I'm, I have to decide if, you know, how much I continue doing that was I just opened up and I said, I'm just going to create space. If you just want to come in here and just talk about life right now during this thing, I want to look back on my life and say, I was on the right side of history on things. I want to look back and say, I added to the beauty during these difficult times. And one of the things that I feel like I can do, I don't have a lot to offer the world in terms of this, but I can say, Hey, if you just want to come on, we'll just, whoever joins us from wherever in the world, come on, we'll just chat about what is life like right now? What are we struggling with? How are we doing? How are we overcoming loneliness? What things are you doing to try to keep exercise going? Whatever it yeah. might be for people. And, and that's just, a free yeah. Zoom call you're doing. Yeah, just an open forum for anybody to come on. And the strategic side would say, okay, it helps me build my brand, but I'm not a self-promoter. I'm not on there saying, okay, now everybody that jumped on here, make sure you check out you know, my website. That's just not my deal. It really right. is honestly about what little things can I do to help make the world a better place in the middle of all of this chaos yeah. and people struggling with it? And, you know, some people might be listening to this right now saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And it might not be for you. And that's great. I'm glad it's not a big deal for you. But there are a lot of people who either practically or emotionally are just ravaged by this thing. They don't want to be in fear, but they are. Yeah. And you might say, that's ridiculous. It doesn't matter. That doesn't help that person. That person's in deep fear. And if I can have one little ounce of goodness to help speak into their life a little bit and say, you know, maybe it'll be okay. Or at least there's other people that are having the same place and help them not feel crazy. To me, that's a win. You know, I live out in rural Minnesota. Part of me wants to live in like inner city Italy so I can go on my balcony and I can play my trombone and join everybody else. That's, you know, th those are really cool things, right? Well, I could go play music out my front door and nobody would hear it because nobody lives close to me. So this is sort of my small contribution to society as a whole. Wow. And these are weekly, Steve, or how often are they? I've just done a couple of them and I haven't actually set them up as weekly. I think I'm going to do that, kind of waiting for some feedback from other people to see if, you know, what they thought of it or whatever. But I think if there's a hunger for that and, you know, if your audience says, man, I'd love to have a place to just do that. And if you don't already have a place, I'd love to hear feedback from them as well. Just let me know if there's demand, I'll do it. I just don't want to, you know, do it if, you know, it's not really well received. But if people are looking for a place to just be, and, you know, I'm very careful to not politicize it. You know, as soon as somebody says, I think we should have handled it this way or that way, I immediately say, you know what, that's a great discussion. It's not the purpose of this. Right. And so if people are worried about it becoming that, I nip that in the bud. And the beauty of Zoom, is, I, as you know, is I have the power to mute anybody. So I haven't had to use that yet, but I can. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Steve, this has been such an enlightening conversation. I want to ask you two final questions as we wrap up. The final, final question is going to be, how do people get connected and stay connected to more Steve Brilliance? But even before we get to that, if folks were to look at your entrepreneurial journey and all the fantastic work that you're doing, 
with your nonprofit, with you know all the things. When they go to stevefriendland.com, they're going to see all of that. We're going to put that in the show notes, by the way, right below this episode at thespeakingshow.com. You will find all of Steve's information and social media accounts and all kinds of other fun. But what do you hope people would take from the lessons that you've learned starting and evolving and maturing your business to the point where it is today? I would say two things. One is get crystal clear on what it is that you want to do. And I think that even starts with get crystal clear on what you want from life. And that even starts with get crystal clear on who you are as a person. Like I'm just such a believer in clarity, clarity, clarity. And I think we so often, we sort of live life by default. We say, oh, that looks really good. I'm going to do that. Or that person's really cool. I'm going to be like that person. And I think what I've learned through myself and through coaching is that we wake up one day and we say, I'm not even living my own life. I'm living the life somebody else either planned for me or whatever. It was kind of the default life that was given. And so I would say, you know, in whatever it is, this broad your life or just your specific business venture, get clear on what it is you're actually trying to do and sit down with a coach or sit down with somebody who will keep asking you why questions until you can't ask that question anymore. Well, why do you want to be successful? Nobody's ever asked me that. I mean, it's a legitimate question. Why do you want to be successful? And the answer to that question will impact a ton of decisions you make about your business. And you say, well, I don't know. I just, maybe I want to be recognized. Cool. Okay. That's being honest. Why do you want to be recognized? Oh, this is so frustrating. I get that all the time. This is so frustrating. I know it's maddening, but when we get to the actual answer, that clarity on what you're trying to do and who you are is going to radically improve everything you do going forward and make your life more fulfilling. And so I think clarity on what it is you're trying to do. And then I would second that with, And then the intentionality to make it happen. Very rarely does it just sort of drop in your lap. You need to be intentional about pursuing that clarity of vision that you have. That's my key takeaway so far in life. So powerful. And I'll tell you, I think this is about that phrase, many paths up the mountain, but you want to make sure you're on the right mountain. So once we have that ultimate outcome and you see and I see what that ultimate outcome is, there's lots of creative paths up that mountain But if we keep having the blinders on, we risk climbing all the wrong mountains for all the wrong reasons. I love it. That would describe, I would say, my first 28 years in the corporate world. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't successful. It doesn't mean it wasn't valuable. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. It was great, provided a great lifestyle. But I woke up at, you know, 48 years old and said, oh, my God, I'm on the wrong mountain. This is a good mountain. It's a healthy mountain. But just for myself, I could just tell... I was on the wrong mountain. So I need to kind of restart climbing the new mountain, but I'm so glad I started a year and a half ago because I'm a little bit up the mountain now. I tell people, I say, I have never worked harder. I've never made less money, but I've never been happier. And so that's the trade-off, right? I mean, you can choose to make more money and work less hours. That's perfectly legitimate. But for me, the happiness side is where I really want to go right now. Boy, amen times 10. Well, Steve, this was totally fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know folks want to get connected to you, stay connected to you, you know, read your writing, stay connected with all of your brilliance. Where can we send them? What resources? Where should people go? I would say just go to stevefredland.com and uh, everything's out there. You can sign up for the newsletter. That's probably the best way to stay in contact. And then I'm just a much more personal one-on-one guy. So we've got some stuff out there. You can see what I'm doing. You can see the talks that I'm, I'm focusing on right now. If you're looking for a speaker, virtual or real, I'd love to chat about that. But just get connected and then shoot me an email or give me a call and let's just talk about life and talk about what's going on there and see if there's a good fit for what I bring to the table. But stevefredlin.com will get you started. Fantastic. Thank you, my friend. Great to have you on. Thank you, David. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time.